Good morning. Before we begin with the lessons, uh, what we're going to do this morning is a brief set of instructions during the Eucharist. Some of you may have heard of an instructed Eucharist before. What we're actually going to do is do some instruction both today and on Father's Day. So the instructions today will have to do with the Liturgy of the Word, the first part of the service, and about a month from now on Father's Day we'll give some brief instructions about the Liturgy of the Table or the Holy Communion. So I'd like to invite Mary Evenson to come up briefly for a bit of a word about the Scripture readings and the lectionary. Within Christianity, the use of pre-assigned scheduled readings from the Scriptures can be traced back to the early Church and seems to have been inherited from Judaism. Not all of the Christian church used the same lectionary, and throughout history, many varying lectionaries have been used in different parts of the Christian world. Until the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, most Western churches, Catholics, Old Catholics, Anglicans, Lutherans, and Wesleyan Methodists used a lectionary that repeated on a one-year basis, the annual lectionary provided readings for Sundays and feast days. After Vatican II, the Roman lectionary was revised to um, work on a three-year cycle. So that exposed people to much more of the scripture than they had been on just a one-year cycle. And eventually, most of the Protestant churches developed the same sort of three-year cycle for the lectionary. Um, typical Sunday readings are a passage from the Old Testament, um, something from the, new, the Acts of the Apostles, the Epistles, one of the Psalms, and of course the Gospels. The Gospel readings are in, from year A, are taken from the book of Matthew. Those in year B are from the Gospel of Mark. Year C is from the Gospel of Luke. Portions of the Gospel of John are always read during the Easter season and are also used during Advent and Christmas and Lent where appropriate. Um, lot, most of the churches that we would come in, encounter with do use the common lectionary. So, for instance, the Lutherans down the street are probably hearing the same lectionary that we're going to be hearing today. And that is kind of a way of bringing us all together. Uh, what we hear in church is just, you know, a few snippets of the Bible. It's a good thing to get into a Bible study, read it on your own, so that you get some context for the stories that we're doing in church. And that way you have more time to discuss it as well. So if you're not involved in a Bible study outside of what we do on Sunday mornings, I would definitely encourage you to look into something like that as well. Thank you. Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for our children. Thank you for the things they teach us. And we thank you for the things that we need to learn. And we pray your Holy Spirit would be upon us to magnify the loudness of the things in our lives you would have us to do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my part of the instructed Eucharist is to talk about the sermon and the Nicene Creed. We come together every Sunday for the liturgy. It's a... Uh, we are a liturgical church. Churches that have this form and order are called liturgical churches. So the word refers to the order, but it also has the meaning of the work of the people. That's what the liturgy is, the work of the people. You think you just come to church to hear or listen, but actually we come to church to do the work of praising God. And we all participate in that, and I can prove it because I'm typically the one who does the sermons. And those of you who have done sermons can bear me out on this. There are typically just a few reactions to sermons. <laughs> well, the most popular response is silence. Think about that one. But sometimes what we get is, good sermon, Father Ralph. And at this time, I ask the question, what did you hear? Yes. And most of the time, what you've heard has nothing to do with what I said. <laughs> I think what happens is, during the sermon time, you're doing the liturgy. 
you're communicating with the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit's communicating with you, and together you're getting what you need to hear. That's how it's supposed to work. That's my prayer. That doesn't mean I don't do the work. Every Sunday, I try to be prepared. I, I look through the text and pray about what should I preach from, and sometimes it's because it's the things that interest me and, 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 and cause me that little twist, like some Sundays I'd want to preach from the one where it says, but Paul, very much annoyed. Because <laughs> that just stuff just tweaks me, you know? But really, for this Sunday, it's the gospel message. Most sermons are centered around the gospel message or refer back to it. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that's us, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. We hear the word. The sermon expounds upon the word. Later, we will say the Nicene Creed. We'll affirm our faith together, all with this goal of moving us to be one. And later, we won't talk about the table today. That'll be Father's Day. We'll practice and experience that oneness that the word calls us to. But that's part of our liturgical work is to hear that gospel message and let the Holy Spirit move us. Then, after the sermon, we move to the Nicene Creed. And I pray that it become more than just words that we say, that you take some time with them. Play with them in your head and heart a little bit. Pick out on one Sunday all the verbs, another Sunday all the pronouns, Pay attention even maybe to the commas. Any English teachers here? Yeah, one. The commas matter. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and how, this is how we say it, of all that is seen and unseen. But that isn't what it says. It says, of all that is seen and unseen. Important? You know, heads go both ways on that, but it is there on purpose. And we're to think and pray about it. Some people tell me, well, when we say the creed, I cross my fingers. Usually that means they don't understand what's being said. And the one part that gives people the most problem is we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And they say, Father Ralph, I'm not Roman Catholic. But that's not what this word Catholic means here. It means the one universal church. It's really about the oneness communicated in today's gospel lesson. We affirm our faith together. We may not be all the same. We may not believe every particular piece all the same, but we are one in Christ. And that is Christ's prayer for us. Before he died, that's the last message. That's the last prayer with his disciples, that we be one so that the world will know that they are loved. And so even the creed, as we stand together and say it, is an expression of our oneness in Christ. And um, my prayer is that we let it be that because the church, just a bit of trivia, has gotten in arguments about the Nicene Creed. It was written in 325, employed in the church not f long after that. But how many of you have heard of the Great Schism? Yeah. What did they fight about? What did the Eastern and Western churches fight about? This thing. Because the Western church added some words, the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Western church added, add the Son, and the Son. And the Eastern church said, no, we're not doing it. The Western church said, yeah, we are. They said, well, then we're not going to be together. The thing that the church added to bring us to oneness, we used to separate. 
part of our prayer needs to be, Lord, forgive us our divisiveness. Lead us with your Spirit to be one as you intend. And as we all come to the table, may it be so. Continuing with our instructed Eucharist, just a couple words on the prayers of the people. Why do we pray? What is prayer? And all these questions that we might have. I invite you to sit or kneel, whatever is most comfortable for you. So what is prayer? A lot of people, when, when I ask them that question, they want to say, oh, it's when I talk to God or when I communicate with God. And I think that's really true. I would like to suggest that it's something far deeper than that, that prayer is our posture before God. It's our attitude towards God. If you all wanted to express to me right now if you were uninterested in what I was saying but didn't want to use any words, you could very easily show me with your body language. You'd sit back, you'd lie down, you'd talk to your neighbor or look at your neighbor or maybe just walk out. So I think sometimes prayer is much more than just our talking to God or waiting for God to talk back to us, but it's our very posture before God. So, and we pray because we're Jesus followers. We're Christians, and Jesus taught his followers to pray. It was one of the central things that he invited his followers to do. Sometimes when we pray, if you're like me, that we really feel a deep sense of the presence of God, and we're, we're, we feel very close to God in prayer. If you're like me, sometimes when you pray, you don't feel that at all, and you feel almost distant from God. And those are the times where I start to wonder, why do, I, why do we even pray? But I think those are the times where we press into it, because again, we're doing something here so that we're better at it out there. Liturgy is the work of the people here so that we become the people of God out there. So here on Sunday mornings when we pray, it says the prayer of who? The people. Not a person, but the people. This is corporate prayer. This is very, very different than you kneeling at your bedside and just you and God together. This is all of us together. This is us practicing being one together in prayer, as Jesus invites us to be in our gospel reading this morning. As Mary said when we talked about the, the, the reading of the Word, we hear the same lessons as some other churches in the area too. We're practicing being one with one another. So when we pray, we're doing this corporately, not as individuals. Yes, individual prayer is essential in our relationship with God, but we are practicing this unity, being one together. So how do we pray? Most often, we're, we're invited to sit or to kneel or to stand. But again, I don't, think, I don't think your physical posture is more important. You could do jumping jacks up and down the aisle and still be in prayer with God. It might be a bit distracting to your neighbors. But in this setting, we invite you to kneel because that's a very humble position. Right? To be penitent before God is, is an important posture for us to take. It's not essential, but it's a beautiful practice for kneeling. And finally, what do we pray for? Here on Sunday mornings, we pray for the universal church, as Father Ralph mentioned before. We pray for the church and for the people and its mission. We pray for the nation and all who are in authority. We pray for the world itself, for its care and for its, uh, for its welfare. We pray for church leaders, depending on what version of the prayers of the people we're, we're using. Sometimes we mention bishops, sometimes we mention priests or deacons. We mention lay leaders as well. We pray for the sick. We pray for those who are in trouble, those who are oppressed and suffering. And we also pray for those who have died, the departed, and remember them. So these are the things that we do in prayer, corporately, together, our posture before God. Not as individuals, but as one, as one body of Christ. So in that light, I invite us to, in peace, we pray to you, Lord God.